for any relevance with regard to Syria and Palestine. Uh, Dr. Michael Talbot is senior lecturer in history at the University of Greenwich, specializing, thank you, specializing in the history of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, previously, he was at the uh, ERC postdoctoral fellow as part of Mediterranean Reconfigurations, uh, a project at the University of Paris One. He teaches Ottoman history at the University of St. Andrews. Uh, at the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London, and he uh, has also served as a visiting lecturer at St. Mary's University and, at, and the University of Warwick. The PhD thesis of, my, of Dr. Michael Talbot, which title, which title is uh, British Ottoman Relations, 1661-1870, uh, uh, Commerce and Diplomatic Practice in 18th Century Istanbul is, uh, is a thesis that used the, case study, used the case study of the British Embassy in Istanbul in a long 18th century to demonstrate the intimates, intimate, intimate links between mercantile interests, provision of finance, cultural conventions, and diplomatic practice. At the present, he's working in, in the different research projects that include Ottoman maritime space and law in the 18th century and beyond, and in a number of studies relating to Ottoman diplomacy and Ottoman Palestine. Uh, he published a great, number of artic, uh, a great number of articles. I want to emphasize, emphasize uh, the exalted column, the Hedas, Reiwala in Imperial Legitimation in Late Ottoman Haifa, in 2015 in Urban, Urban History. She, he also published Jews be Ottomans, Zionist Ottomanism and Ottomani, Ottomanization, Ottomanization in the Hebrew language press in the Wild des Islams in uh, 2016. And more recently, he uh, has published uh, Sparks of Appenstance, Photographs, Public Celebrations and the Ottoman Military Ban of Jerusalem in the Journal of the Ottoman and Turkish Studies Associations. Uh, it, it is all, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. M Michael Tabor, for accept uh, our invitation, and when you want, that's great. Is that a good level? Can you hear me okay? That's good, thank you. Um, I must start with an apology that, of course, I will be giving this presentation in English and not in Catalan or in Spanish, um, so please forgive my Anglo-Saxonness for that. Um, if, there's any, if I'm going too fast, please just tell me to slow down. Um, and if you want me to repeat anything, please do say. It's a really great um, pleasure to be here um, to talk about this really uh, important subject of this late Ottoman refugee crisis and how it might relate to the contemporary situation with regards to refugees um, in Syria and Palestine. And I'm very, very grateful um, for the invitation um, to be here. So this project... Um, is part of a collaborative project that I've been working with um, Dr. Lauren Banco of the University of Yale. Uh, she's a specialist in the history of Palestine. She works on ideas of Palestinian citizenship. And she kind of tasked me with going to the archives in Istanbul to see what I could find about refugees settling in Palestine and Syria at the end of the Ottoman period. And some of the stuff that I found there, <coughs> excuse me, was quite interesting, I think, and forms the basis of this paper. Um, hands up, has anyone done much Ottoman history before? Can I just see a show of hands? Has anyone studied any Ottoman history before? Hands up if you've studied Ottoman history. A little bit, one person kind of, okay. A little bit, okay, fine. Um, I, I'll be pitching then at the level of, this is the first time you're doing it. So if you have any questions or want anything else explained, um, please do let me know. So as I'm sure you're aware, um, in recent years, the refugee crisis in Europe has dominated headlines in newspapers, it has changed governments, it has been a, a really key issue in a number of European countries. The way in which this um, crisis has been dealt with, um, both in a rhetorical and a practical level, has often been deeply problematic. Um, the dehumanization of refugees, the homogenization of different groups of refugees, um, and of course their, their poor treatment by certain governments has been a major factor um, in um, this, this unfolding crisis, which of course continues on a number of levels. 
Um, but what's important to remember is that this refugee crisis has a history, um, and there's a history within that history too. Um, and I was, I was reflecting um, on my way here. It's been almost 15 years since I was last in Barcelona. And the, the number of things that have happened in those intervening 15 years in the Middle East in particular is something that we never could have imagined. Now, the Middle East, of course, today is associated with a refugee crisis. But historically, there have been a great number of um, mass displacements, sometimes um, um, voluntary economic migrations, but very often forced migrations, most notably, of course, the Palestinian Nakba of uh, 1948, um, whose 70th anniversary we marked um, earlier this year. So the Middle East has often been a site um, of the creation of refugees. Um, but what's particularly interesting to me is to think of the Middle East not as simply a creator of refugees, but as a recipient of them. Because once upon a time, Palestine and Syria um, made, uh, uh, were, were su sufficiently attractive homes to receive different kinds of refugees. So we can think about um, migration in the late Ottoman period on a number of levels that I'd like to take you through quite briefly as a bit of background. So thinking about the late Ottoman period, so the Ottoman Empire, I'll show you a map of that in a bit more detail shortly, um, rules um, in um, over 600 years, right? So it's a very long lasting empire. At its height, it covers a third of Europe, it rules what's now the modern Republic of Turkey, most of the Middle East, and large chunks of North Africa. This empire shrinks um, in the 18th century and the 19th century, and that's where we pick the story up in the final decades of Ottoman existence in the late 19th century and the early 20th century. Now, in that period, the final decades of the Ottoman Empire, there are a number of mass movements of people um, um, some of them leaving the region, but very often coming into it. So perhaps the most notable um, of the mass migrations um, from the Ottoman Middle East um, is the great movement of Syrians, Palestinians, and Lebanese to North and South America. So in places like Brazil and Mexico and Argentina, the United States and Canada, there develops a significant population of Syrians, Lebanese, and Palestinians, um, of all religions and, um, and colors and creeds, um, and this is largely down to economic um, factors. So there are a number of famines, um, there are a number of um, economic crises in the late Ottoman Empire that force many tens of thousands of um, uh, Syrians, Palestinians, and Lebanese to seek new opportunities in the New World, and indeed the populations of Lebanese, Syrians, and Palestinians in Central, uh, South, and North America are still quite significant um, today. So that's one major movement of people out of Palestine and Syria. But we also see other groups coming into Palestine and Syria seeking to make new homes in this region. Perhaps most famous amongst these groups, of course, are the early waves of migration of Jews from Central and Eastern Europe fleeing persecution in places like Russia and Poland um, and Romania, um, and who, following this new political ideology of Zionism, Jewish nationalism, seek to establish a Jewish homeland or at least a Jewish settlement in Palestine. So the Zionist Jews are perhaps the most notable of the waves of refugees and migrants who come to Palestine in the late 19th century, but they're by no means the most significant, and simply because of what's happened in the Middle East as a result of the creation of the State of Israel, the displacement of the Palestinian people, this particular wave of migration has perhaps been given undue weight in the historical analysis. There are many other waves of people coming into Palestine who are often num numerically more significant as well as politically more significant. For example, we have a significant number of Circassian Muslims fleeing the ever-expanding Russian Empire in the Caucasus who come and make their homes in northern Palestine and southern Syria. Um, indeed, there are still communities of Circassians in um, Jordan, Syria, and Israel today. If you ever look at the King of Jordan when he's out and about, his uh, royal guards are the Circassians or their descendants. Um, in the Israeli state, they have a special status and are conscripted into the Israeli armed forces. So they have a very separate identity still 
and this is the, the, the legacy of the migration of um, Circassians, um, which is a whole grouping of different kinds of, of Caucasian populations um, who are either encouraged to leave or forcibly displaced by the ever-expanding Russian Empire. And I'll, I'll come to that um, a little bit, uh, that background a bit uh, uh, shortly. We also have um, a huge amount of unrest in the Balkans in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, partly due to growing nationalism, partly due again to the expansion of empires like um, the Austro-Hungarians. So we also find significant populations of Bulgarians and Bosnians coming to make their homes in Palestine and Syria. Um, the Bosnians don't have a very happy story. They end up getting settled in a part of Palestine that's quite marshy. Most of them end up dying from malaria, so it's not a very happy home for them. Um, but still, we do have um, these waves of people coming in. But the two groups that I want to focus on um, as part of my presentation today are two of the most important but least studied of the waves of migration from within the Ottoman Empire or the former Ot Ottoman Empire into Palestine and Syria. The first of these are Algerians um, who um, flee French colonial oppression to make their homes in northern Palestine. Um, from the middle of the 19th century onwards, and I'm going to be speaking in a bit of detail uh, in, a, in a bit later about that particular community. The second group that I want to focus on, and one that has a particular resonance with the current refugee crisis, um, are Muslims um, from the island of Crete in the Mediterranean, and a significant number of Cretan Muslims um, fleeing um, nationalism and sectarian violence on that island um, make their homes in, in Lebanon and in um, Syria. So those are the two groups that I want to talk about today, um, in part because they have a legacy in subsequent refugee crises. So we find multiple layers of refugees throughout history. So this particular area of the Middle East that we now associate so much with violence, with oppression, um, it's not generally somewhere that we, I think, would like to make our homes, particularly. Um, but this is somewhere in the 19th century that is a very attractive prospect for a number of refugee populations. It's also an attractive prospect for the Ottoman Empire to settle these refugee populations in these areas as a way of asserting and, um, and uh, consolidating imperial control in these highly significant provinces because the Ottoman Empire in this period is in a great deal of flux. Now to understand the background to this refugee story, we need to have a bit of a sense of what the Ottoman Empire was in the later 19th century. It's a very old state. As I mentioned, it's, it's, uh, it dates back to the 14th century in one form or another, the Ottoman Empire. So it's a very old state by the time we get to the 19th century. But it's a state that of course, like all other states in Europe and beyond, is facing the challenges of modernity and what to do with new economic systems and new political orders. And so throughout the 19th century, the Ottoman Empire undergoes an intensive program of modernization on all fronts of the empire's existence. It starts, of course, with the imperial administration, the modernization of the Ottoman army, the civil administration, and this starts to then have an impact in civil society as well. So we start to see Ottoman elites and then a trickle-down effect to some extent adopting European-style clothing, um, bourgeois um, sensibilities, and so forth. So the Ottoman Empire is really trying to find its place in the world in the 19th century. And this necessarily means spending a great deal of money on modern institutions, from schools to railways to telegraph networks to battleships, you name it, all the things that a modern state needs, the Ottoman Empire invests in. But when you have to spend money, you very often quickly run out of it. And the Ottoman Empire, unfortunately for it, undergoes a severe series of financial crises as a result of its um, spending spree on the trappings of modernity. Um, to such an extent that by the middle of the 1870s, the empire is effectively bankrupt and has to look to um, its neighbors to the north and the west, particularly the British and the French, to come up with an agreement to bail them out, to allow them to regain their credit lines. So in 1881, 
the Ottomans undergo um, what becomes known as the public debt administration. So significant parts of the Ottoman state revenues are diverted to paying off loans provided by French and British creditors. Um, this allows the Ottomans to get back their credit line, but this is obviously a devastating blow to the empire's prestige. They are unable to pay their bills and are now dominated financially by their Western European neighbours. Now, as a result and of these various modernization efforts and financial crises, the empire finds itself incredibly vulnerable to certain predatory neighbours. And the most important of these predatory neighbours, represented by that rather fantastic-looking octopus there, is the growing empire of Russia. Now, Russia has expanded as far as it can go to the east. It's got to the Pacific in the 17th century. It's expanding into Central Asia too. And so really the next logical place for this rapacious Russian empire to turn is to the lands of the Ottoman realms. Um, and this starts by the, the Russians taking over Ottoman territory around the Black Sea. And eventually they start to move down into the Caucasus. The Russians are also major sponsors of nationalist movements amongst the Christian populations of the Ottoman Empire in the Balkans, particularly in places like Bulgaria. So Russia becomes a major, major problem for the Ottoman state. And in a series of catastrophic wars, the Ottomans, despite all their best efforts to modernize, find themselves being defeated quite um, convincingly by the Russian army, particularly in a, in a devastating war in 1877, 1878. Now, as the Russians come in to new areas around the Black Sea and around the Caucasus, they're not particularly interested in keeping the local Muslim population there. There is an intensive program of Russification and Christianization, and so many hundreds of thousands of refugees um, are created as a result of Russian conquests of formerly Ottoman territory. And we can even see from this Russian propaganda painting um, that they're quite honest about the fact that whenever the Ottoman army gets evicted, very often the local population gets evicted too. And the nearest place for them to go is into the heartlands of the Ottoman Empire itself. So we have a state that's suffering financially that all of a sudden finds itself having to support a significant increase um, in its population and a poor increase in terms of um, refugees as well. So Russia is a big threat and a major catalyst in the development of a number of these refugee groups coming into the Ottoman realms. We also have another threat developing on other fronts that means the Ottomans are in severe trouble in the 19th century. Former allies like the British and French start to take advantage of Ottoman weakness, picking off Ottoman um, provinces one by one, particularly in North Africa. So from 1830, the French go into Algeria. As a result of the financial crisis, we find the French also taking over Tunisia and the British, as we can see here, um, taking over Ottoman Egypt. And the Brits will also go on to take the island of Cyprus. So the Ottomans are finding themselves unable to rely on former allies and their territory is gradually shrinking. And each of these movements also creates a displacement of people. So whenever the Europeans move into a new territory, that creates a, a, a small or large, depending on the territory, refugee crisis. So just to give us a sense of how quickly and dramatically the empire changes in the 19th century, we can see by this map. So the red line, oh, I've got a pointer. There we go. So you can see the extent of the empire in the year 1800, it's still pretty big, right? So huge amounts of territory in Southeast Europe, a large chunk of North Africa, and the heartlands of the Middle East. Now, one by one, we can start to see these territories being lost. So Algeria goes in 1830. We can see the development of Russian influence around here with new nationalist movements in Greece and in Romania. Then we see the second wave of the loss of territory with the European states taking over in North Africa here and the further sponsorship of nationalist movements in the Balkans. So in the space of less than a century, the Ottoman Empire goes from being a diverse state on three continents to being quite geographically condensed to Asia and increasingly a more homogeneously Muslim population. So we gradually start to lose 
the Christian minority populations either to Russian rule or to independence movements. So the Ottoman Empire really changes its character quite dramatically. So you think of all these different things going on, the modernization process, the financial crisis, and the loss of territory. This is the background to the, um, the Ottoman refugee crises um, of the um, 19th and 20th centuries. So we then need to understand um, that this is a state that is suffering quite a lot in terms of its political outlook, that then has to deal somehow with a series of mass influxes of people. And we know how hard that is in the 21st century to, in, to, um, to support refugees, to find them somewhere to live, to find the money to get them um, ingratiated, assimilated into society. So the Ottoman Empire really has a strong um, um, problem on its hands. And the concentration of refugees into this one particular geographic region is particularly important to consider. So how do the Ottomans go about doing it? Well, they go about by setting up in 1860 a special commission for refugees. So this is a professional organization tied to the state administration that's in charge of finding solutions and finding a budget to deal with this new influx of people into the Ottoman realms. And from this particular um, document, which highlights here, so we have this keyword, muhajirin, which is the Ottoman word for refugees. Um, and then it has specifically muhajiriya islamiya. So these are specifically for Muslim refugees, right? So this is the big focus of the Ottoman state. In part, it's a response to the, um, the loss of territory and the homogenization of the empire that I mentioned before. The Ottomans, particularly under the reign of a sultan called Abdul Hamid II, start to really emphasize the Islamic character of the empire. And the sultan starts to really emphasize his role as the caliph of Islam. Now, we've heard this word caliph coming up quite a lot in recent years, of course, because of the Islamic State. But this was a recognized caliphate. The Ottomans had been caliphs since the 16th century and were widely recognized in the Muslim world as such. And the emphasis on the Sultan being the protector of Muslims, not just Ottoman Muslims, but Muslims around the world, is a very important political move. Because the Ottomans are not the largest uh, Muslim empire in the world in the 19th century. Does anyone have any idea who the largest Muslim empire might be in the 19th century? Any guesses? Who's the largest Muslim empire? Who's got the most Muslims in their territory? Who'd like to guess? Good guess, but no. You didn't think it'd be an interactive lecture, did you? Any guesses? Indonesia. Who, who is ruling Indonesia? Any guess? Who, does, who rules Southeast Asia in the 19th century? The Dutch, right? So the French and the British and the Dutch are the largest Muslim empires in the world. They have significant Muslim populations. So if the Ottoman Sultan can show that he's the protector of all the world's Muslims, then that's a good way to undermine the European imperial powers. So this emphasis on this refugee commission, not simply being a commission for refugees in general, but as part of this performance of the caliphate, is a super, super um, important element to the story of the Ottoman refugee crisis. So let's deal with the first group of refugees that I'd like to share with you this evening, and that is the, um, the Algerian refugees who come across to Palestine in several major waves from the middle of the 19th century until its end, so over about a, f a 40, 50 year period. Now, Algeria had been part of the Ottoman Empire in one way or another since the early 16th century. It had been largely autonomous, to some extent it's even been independent, but it had nominally been part of the Ottoman Sultan's realms. This changes from 1830 um, with the expansion of French empire in the Mediterranean. So the French uh, embark upon a series of foreign policy exercises, in part to, dis to distract from problems and revolutions back at home. Um, and um, very quickly, um, Algeria comes under French rule. This is not without a significant degree of resistance from a variety of local groups in Algiers and beyond, including one 
led by this rather handsome individual, Abdel Qadir. And he is a very, very important um, member of the Algerian resistance movement. And he fights against the French throughout the 1840s, um, finally being forced to capitulate in 1847 and heading off into exile. Now, as part of the conditions of his surrender, he and some of his followers are granted the opportunity to spend their exile in the Ottoman Empire. It doesn't quite work out for him. He's forced to go to France for a while. But many of his followers decide that they will take up this offer. And so they move towards the east through Egypt and into Ottoman Palestine, where they start to set up communities in, um, in villages in the north of Palestine. And it's from their attempts to set up um, new institutions and new villages that we get to hear the voices of these refugees themselves and to understand a bit about their experiences. What we've learned from the re recent refugee crises is that refugees generate an awful lot of paperwork on the part of the state, whether it's issuing ID documents, hearing their social issues and so forth. And this is very much the case with our Algerian refugees. The main traces that we have of them in the Ottoman archives is due to the fact that they generate an awful lot of paperwork. And very often this paperwork comes from the refugees themselves submitting um, petitions asking for various forms of help from the Ottoman government. And so in the Ottoman archives in Istanbul, there are many documents like this one. This is a petition from um, the leader, a sheikh, of a particular group of Algerian families whom, who, are, um, who make the migration from Algeria to Palestine in the late 1880s. So they're one of the last waves of Algerians to move over towards Palestine. And in this particular document, we learn a little bit about their journey and their reasons for escaping. This is the original document in Arabic. Here's a bit of a translation. Um, from some of the key moments of this. So your supplicant, this is the Sheikh uh, Mohammed, has formally followed the command that you had issued requesting the submission of my passport. Since then, you have commanded that the passports of the 25 families affiliated to this, your supplicant, be presented. So he's come along with his whole tribe, basically. There's 25 families, men, women, and children. Following an examination of the families concerning their documentation, some found their passports, but some did not. And this was down to their disorder and irregularity. So they don't all have identification documents. However, I still await other documentation. I will not hide the fact that there were tightened limitations on the people with regard to travel. So the French were trying to stop people from leaving the country. And these limitations meant that those people who wanted to leave had to flee by whatever route that would enable them to escape. And we know from the dates that these people arrived in Palestine that they were moving clandestinely. They were moving whenever they, kept, they could in small groups and meeting up again once they made it to safety. Truly, he says, I entered in flight with my community to the protective shade of the beloved sublime state. That's what the Ottomans call themselves. It's a good name for a country, right? The sublime state. And to reside in the land of Islam. So they know which buttons to push. If you um, big up the, uh, the Sultan's Islamic credentials, you're going to get favour. And now for two months, I have incurred outrageous expenses for my people and my children. I do not hide this from your excellency, so please investigate the situation and grant your beneficence with regard to settlement. So from these documents, short documents like this, we get a bit of a sense of the process of migration and the difficulties that these people faced in finding homes and finding stability on their arrival in Palestine. This is the list that um, Sheikh Mohammed presented, um, detailing all the heads of the families with the number of people in them. And the um, little commentaries on the side there um, indicate the families that have passports and the dates that their passports were issued. And we can see that a significant number of these people have managed to make it out of Algiers somehow without any doc documentation. And how this has happened um, and, and why this has happened becomes apparent um, through another series of documents. Sorry, I'm a very boring document historian. I get very excited by them. Not everyone enjoys them, but bear with me, I promise. Um, so this is a very important agreement that was reached between the French and the Ottoman authorities um, at the end of the 1880s. And it's to try and govern the rules by which Algerians might go to the Ottoman Empire and what citizenship they might hold. Now, there's a series of law changes in Algeria at the end of the 1880s where the French, for the first time, grant limited citizenship rights to, Ottoman, to Algerian Muslims. 
So the Algerians are then faced with becoming the citizens of two countries. They might be Algerian citizens of French-occupied Algeria, but they might also take up Ottoman citizenship. And the Ottomans are kind of worried that this will allow the Algerians to get all the benefits of being an Ottoman citizen whilst using their French citizenship to get out of any duties that they might have incumbent upon them. So this special agreement that's signed between the French and Ottoman authorities tries to limit that. So the agreement says in, number, in point number two, those Algerians coming separately to Syria and carrying French passports from this time and who register their passports at the French consulate are considered to have French citizenship and are therefore unable to get Ottoman citizenship. In accordance with that second article, an official register containing the names of those Algerians who registered their passports at the consulate will be presented to the Ottoman government. So the Ottomans want to see who's coming in and who keeps their French passport and who doesn't. If you keep your French passport, you don't get to become an Ottoman citizen and you don't get to settle in Palestine. So you have to make a choice. Do you want to side with the French or do you want to sign with the Ottomans? Now we, we find out why so many of our Algerians are missing their passports through this document of the governor of the Beirut province that's sent back to Istanbul. He says that the Algerians were able to produce eight passports dating from the time when their bearers left Algeria. As a result of hardships and oppressions, they left a brief window of opportunity and quickly came. So again, we know that they're leaving at very short notice, um, often um, um, illegally. Some of their companions came in small groups and in a secret manner and so escaped without their passports. Others declared that they destroyed their passports when they came to the realms of the sublime state. So rather than risk being labelled as French citizens and therefore potentially losing the right to settle in Palestine and Syria, many of these Algerians actually destroy their French passports on arrival in the Ottoman lands. So this little list here tells us something quite important about the nature of refugee administration and the settlement process. It's not as straightforward as simply being a Muslim grants you the right to live in the Ottoman realms. There's a much more complicated debate about citizenship and legality going on here. One, of course, that we see in our own refugee crisis. What do you do with refugees who turn up on your border with no passports or with fake passports, with no ID cards? This is a thing that we're still trying to grapple with now. So that's the Algerians, and I'll return to, the, to take their story to the next level um, in a few minutes' time. But I'd like to move on to the next, the second group of refugees that I'd like to talk about. And these are one of the least known groups of refugees in the late Ottoman period. And these are the Muslims from Crete. Now, Crete had, again, been part of the Ottoman Empire by this point for quite a long time, since the, it was conquered in the middle of the 17th century. And as a result, there was the development um, of a Muslim population on the island. Now, Crete is in a very difficult position at the end of the 19th century. Greece gains its independence from the Ottoman Empire in 1830, and there is a large rivalry between the Greek state and the Ottoman state. And we still see this played out, right, in the Turkish-Greek rivalry today. That continues. Um, and um, after a number of catalysts, um, this will erupt into a war between Greece and the Ottomans in 1897. Now, one of the sufferers of this conflict, even though this conflict doesn't necessarily take place directly on the island, is the, Greek, uh, is the Cretan population of Muslims. Now, there's a significant population of Muslims living in the major coastal ports on Crete and a, a, a big population, too, in the interior. As a result of growing Greek nationalism, which is very much based around uh, a Greek Orthodox identity, there is an increasing amount of violence, sectarian violence, between Christians and Muslims on the island. And when we have this war between the Ottomans and, and the Greeks, this leads to a, a series of what can only be described as pogroms um, that, that really target the Muslim population. And so gradually, from the 18, late 1890s um, a, until the end of the Ottoman Empire, um, these Cretan Muslims will start to leave the island and seek sanctuary elsewhere. So we have this rather strange case, at least to 21st century perspectives, of boats leaving the Greek islands and traveling to Syria and Palestine, right? This is traffic these days is the other direction, of course. Um, and so many of these, many thousands of these Cretan Muslims flee um, and end up in the port of Tripoli in what's now Lebanon, um, trying to find um, safety and support from the Ottoman government. Now, once again, the archives allow us to get the voices of some of these um, Cretan refugee populations. This is a petition 
that's presented by, as you can see, a sig significant number of um, um, Cretan uh, Muslims. Each of these stamps here represents the head of a, a household of Cretan refugees. So we're talking many hundreds of people represented on just this one document. And the document is presented in Ottoman Turkish in quite pitiful terms describing the, the hardships that these people have just endured. We started off, says the document, friends and strangers banding together. We were rescued from the dusty wilderness and brought to this land, exhausted from so many hardships, hunger and thirst. The people and our family dependents were registered by the government entirely according to the rules, but it's plain as day that we were wasting away from hunger. So they arrive in Syria and Lebanon starving, exhausted, with very few possessions of their own to make a new life with. So once again, the Ottoman Refugee Commission needs to step up its game and find some way to look after these people. And in the Ottoman archives, almost immediately as these people start to arrive in Syria in 1897 onwards, there is a, a request from the Sultan himself that plans should be drawn up to create new, ho new houses and settlements for these Cretan Muslims. And in the Ottoman archives, we have the original plans of some of these settlements. This is a new neighborhood that was designed in the city of Tripoli. So when they arrive, many of the refugees find themselves settled near the port, living in poverty, and that's not a good way to go. So very quickly, within the space of a few months, the Ottoman government, under the auspices of this refugee commission, design and build whole new neighborhoods for these people to live in within the city of Tripoli. And this is one example. Um, you can see that we've got um, a kind of the main road is up here, and this is a, a little off-road where we build new houses. And the detail on this thing is quite wonderful. It goes down to the level of how each individual house will be designed. It shows us where rooms are. It even shows us where our, our oven and our hearth is going to be, our courtyards and so forth, and the exact specifications of the dimensions of these things. And they are built incredibly quickly. So within the space of the year, pretty much, um, we start to see new neighbourhoods arising to house these refugees in uh, Tripoli. But we also have to find somewhere a bit more substantial because of the sheer numbers of refugees from Crete arriving. And so in a, in a really stunning move of organisation, the Ottoman state plans and implements a whole new town to house these Cretan Muslims. And this is the plan of that town. Um, and this place still exists today, Al Hamidiya, in um, southern Syria. It's named after the Sultan, Abdul Hamid II, um, who sponsored its development. And once again, we can see the level of detail here is quite, st ooh, the level of detail here is quite stunning. Um, we can see the individual houses, what they're gonna look like. I mean, they're nothing fancy, but they'll do the job, right? Um, we can see how they're laid out along a grid pattern. We, of course, have a mosque that's constructed in the middle for people to worship and a little shopping centre too, so that they can get all their goods. So this is careful planning on how to create a sustainable centre for refugees that once again is planned and executed within the space of a year or two. So really incredible, given all the other things going on in the Ottoman state at this time. So we have this huge waves of movements of people going on. They're coming in and out for different reasons, but what happens to them afterwards, right? This is the question that often historians don't ask. We look at our period, and then we stop. Well, these two groups of refugees, the Cretans and the Algerians, have very important and rather tragic ends. The Algerians settled in Palestine um, start to develop a number of communities. They have four villages of their own. They also settle in existing Palestinian villages, and they survive after the Ottoman Empire. When the British take over, the Algerians are still there. The thing that changes this, of course, is the Nakba, the Palestinian catastrophe of 1948. And every single one of the Algerian settlements are depopulated and razed to the ground by the Israeli forces in 1948. This, for example, is all that remains of the town of Samakh, which was um, about 60% Algerian refugees, um, and the rest were indigenous Palestinian Arabs. All that remains of it is this water tank, the rest of it is rubble. So too in, this, in the village of Aulam, where our Sheikh Mohammed, who we met before, this is where some of his family settled down, completely razed to the ground. All that remains is rubble. Similarly, in um, the, uh, the former village of Madar, 
um, all that remains there is the outlines of the farmland. There's not even any remains of the rubble level. Um, and in Kafr Sabat, where the other part of Sheikh Mohammed's family go to live, and once again, it's just rubble. So the Algerian refugees who find safety in Palestine end up becoming refugees once again in 1948, subsumed into this wider community of Palestinian refugees. And it's only recently, and I've been receiving lots of nice emails from Palestinians of Algerian descent, that this story has started to emerge, that people are starting to become interested in this history. Because as we often do, we just group all the Palestinians together without thinking that there are these different layers of historical communities within them. So the Algerians in Palestine, unfortunately, do not have a very happy story, and they become refugees once again. What about our Syrian, our Cretan uh, Muslims who go to live in Lebanon and in Syria? Well, they have a bit of a mixed story. So they are still there, or at least until recently were mostly still there. Many of these communities continue to speak their strange version of old Cretan Greek, um, even up into the 21st century. Um, and in the landscape of the port town of Tripoli, the remnants of this Ottoman neighbourhood still remain. Unfortunately, this neighbourhood is not in a very good part of Tripoli. And ever since the 1970s, they have been on the front line of a sectarian war between Sunnis and Shia in Tripoli. And this was a very relatively recent story um, from 2013 in the very neighbourhood that we just saw that had been constructed. Um, and interestingly, the street is now known as Muhajirin Street, the Street of the Refugees. That is a legacy of this Cretan community. So they're in Tripoli still, but on a dangerous front line between the sectarian wars that of course has become worse as a result of the crisis in Syria. But what about those who then lived in Syria, this wonderful town of Al Hamidia, right? Where we build this purpose-built town for our Cretan refugees. Well, of course, they do okay at the beginning of the civil war, but as the violence spread, they too become victims of the violence in modern Syria and found <coughs> themselves once again becoming refugees and forced to live once again in refugee camps and in poverty. But there's a nice twist, maybe nice isn't the right word, there's an interesting twist to this story that came out relatively recently in a BBC News article. As a result of the flight of Syrians towards mainland Europe, many of whom, of course, came by boat across the Mediterranean and landing on the Greek islands, by pure chance, or rather by kind of a, a nice twist of fate, many of the people who once left Crete 100, 100 years ago find themselves coming back as refugees to their former homeland. And there was a huge initiative recently to find a way um, to connect the new Syrian refugees um, with their Cretan roots. And as I mentioned before, many of them still speak an archaic form of Greek. They still, uh, they've picked up some Arabic vocab along the way, um, so they have a, a, a kind of a mixed vocab. But kind of interestingly, after having fled Crete as a result of persecution and finding sanctuary in Syria, they then find themselves going back to Crete, having um, um, faced persecution and trouble um, in um, the modern civil war. So there's an interesting series of layers of history, and um, it perhaps complicates our understanding of modern refugee crises when we start to look at the historical roots of them. We need to remember that the traffic was going in the direction of uh, um, Syria and Palestine in this period, and that many of the people seeking refuge in Europe were themselves the descendants of refugees of one form or another, whether they were Algerians, Syrians, Circassians, Bosnians, whatever they have that history, whether they're aware of it or not. They are part of this mass movement of people. And uh, one of the great tragedies, of course, um, of the current conflicts, whether it be in Palestine or in Syria, is the fact that these people find themselves refugees once more. That's what I've got to say, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on what you think about it. Oh, that's a bit dramatic. The contemporary relevance of this. Um, thank you so much for paying attention, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and now it's your turn. You can ask all about you want to know about this, this, this issue. Um, 
I don't really like speaking here. Um, what do you think about the, the way Europe has been uh, handling the situation with the refugees in the past years? Because there's, there's a few um, outbreak of xenophobia, of course, mm -hmm. um, because of the numbers that have been arriving. Mm -hmm. um, but what do you think about the policies that uh, Europe has been taking in general? It's a difficult question, isn't it? Because the policies have been so varied.